So let's now turn our attention to an overview of concurrent programming concepts. We've talked about the sequential programming concepts and some of the pros and cons. Let's now start talking about concurrency. And we'll see that some of the concepts are going to be allowing two or more threads to run simultaneously and then be able to interact with each other via shared objects, sometimes known as synchronizers, and or message passing. And you'll see that a lot of these concepts help to address the cons, downsides of sequential programming. So concurrent programming is a form of computing where two or more threads can run simultaneously. And I have a little bit of notation here. The little squiggly lines with the arrows on them, those denote threads. And the little gray round angle denotes a process. So what is a thread? A thread is a unit of execution for a stream of instructions that can run concurrently, meaning simultaneously, on one or more processor cores over the lifetime of the thread, from when it starts to when it exits and terminates. That's what a thread is. It's good to remember that. That's a good quiz question. A thread typically runs in the context of a process. That's the little, or that's the gray round angle thing here where the threads are running. And the process allocates and manages various kinds of resources like files, memory, network connections, and so on. And it also prevents corruption of threads within the process from threads in other processes. And it does this via various memory management unit techniques, such as partitioning and MMU protection and so on. If you take the operating system course, you'll learn more about that. So threads, units of execution, processes, units of resource allocation, management, and protection. Here's a very simple example where we're going to loop and spawn five threads. And each of those threads will perform some computation. And you can see we're going to create these five threads. And they're going to run in that process. And they're going to do some computation across four processor cores. This is my whimsical notation of a processor core, like an Apple core. A Java thread object doesn't actually have to run on the same core throughout its lifetime, but instead it can be multiplexed across multiple cores via time slicing. So the operating system scheduler will let the thread run for a while on some core, and then it says, OK, you know, you've had your time, you've had your turn, I'm going to preempt you, I'm going to bring another thread over, it's going to run, it'll run for longer, and so on and so forth. Multiple threads can also be multiplexed over a single core processor. So it's perfectly plausible to have multiple threads over one core or multiple threads over multiple cores. Honestly, it's getting harder and harder to find single core processors for general purpose computing devices. So things like laptops, desktops, servers, next to impossible to find a single core for those. Even for things like smartphones, kind of hard to find stuff for that. If you go into embedded systems, then you'll find that there are still some single core processors, but uh, for the general purpose computing devices that we use most of the time, they're usually multi-core. So they're as rare as, single core processors are as rare as the upside down airplane stamp. Threads don't typically just run in isolation. Oftentimes they interact with each other via something called shared objects, which are also known as synchronizers and or message passing. Shared objects, or synchronizers, are typically used to ensure mutual exclusion between multiple threads and or coordination amongst multiple threads. So here's a simple example where there's a shared synchronizer and threads take turns reading and writing, and the synchronizer makes sure that the reads and writes are properly synchronized so they don't overwrite each other and cause what are known as race conditions. Multiple threads can pass messages via queues that are properly synchronized. So the first approach is the shared object synchronizer approach. The second approach for interaction is through message passing. And that allows multiple threads, which could be two or more, to pass messages to each other via thread safe queues or synchronized queues to do send and receive through the queues. Unlike sequential programs, which we talked about being very deterministic, Different executions of a concurrent program may produce different orderings of instructions. And in fact, on a multi-core processor, are very likely to have different orderings of instructions. 
So as a consequence, unlike sequential code where the texture order defines the order of execution, in concurrent programs, the texture order of the source code does not define the order of execution. So here you can see these different computations are running in any order after their threads start up. And another property is that operations are permitted to overlap in time across multiple cores. So if you've got multiple cores, you can have multiple instructions, and they can run, and you can have overlap. So unlike sequential programming where it's lockstep, one operation starts, when it's logically done, the next operation starts, when it's done, the next thing starts in that sequence in order. With concurrent programs, the different cores can be executing operations and they can overlap and they can run at the same time, they can run at different times. It's much more flexible and non-deterministic. Most commonly, we use concurrent programs to offload work from some user interface thread, of which there's typically one, because there's one user interface, to different background threads that do computations that run for longer periods of time. Because of this architecture, the background threads can afford to block because they aren't going to perturb the responsiveness of the user interface thread. But typically, the user interface thread does not block. So the user interface thread typically will not block. It'll be responsive to, to changes like cancellations, for example. You will see that with your programming assignments. And the background threads can block. And any state that's shared between the different background threads and or the UI thread has got to be protected to avoid concurrency hazards. And there are a bunch of different ways to protect things. What we're trying to avoid here are hazards like race conditions. Race conditions can occur when a program depends on the sequence or the timing of its threads for it to operate properly, such that if threads operate at the wrong time, you'll get corruption. You'll get threads smashing into each other's values or smashing into the values of shared variables. We'll talk a lot about that when we get into uh, concurrency in Java. And I'll talk about different synchronizers that can help you avoid race conditions. There's four different types of synchronizers in Java. There are mutual exclusion mechanisms, there are coordination mechanisms, there are atomicity mechanisms, and there are basically things called barrier synchronizers. Those are the four primary types of Java synchronizers. Message passing can be used to avoid sharing state between multiple threads. So one way to deal with the issue of shared mutable state, which is the root of all evil in concurrent programs, is to use synchronizers. That's the approach we just talked about. The other approach is just not to share the state at all, but instead to pass messages back and forth. So you don't actually share anything. You pass information back and forth. And we'll talk about that when we talk about synchronizers in uh, message passing mechanisms in Java. So that's the end of our overview of concurrent programming concepts. At this point, you don't know enough, unless you already knew how to do programming with threads and synchronizers to really write a program. <laughs> but uh, other than maybe you could see how to spawn a thread, start a thread in Java. But of course, we will get into that as we get further into the discussions.